The Mysteries of the Rosary. We're coming to the end of the month of October, the month in which the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary occurs on the 7th. People often find the Rosary difficult to pray or wonder if they're doing it right. There's no one way to pray the Rosary. A few people can concentrate on each word of the 50 Hail Marys. But occasionally, odd phrases sometimes light up and gain fresh meaning by reference to the different mysteries of the decades of the Rosary. One recipe is to think of the original happening that is the subject of each mystery, and then to compare it to some experience of one's own, and for prayer to arise out of that. It's good to experiment with different ways of praying the rosary. So here are a few thoughts with the intention of stirring meditation on some of the mysteries. So first of all, the joyful mysteries, the Annunciation. Any mother will identify easily with this mystery from her own pregnancy and experience of a new life growing within her and wondering about the future. The visitation is not only about Mary's charity towards her aunt, but it was also the only way in which Mary could confirm that the Annunciation had not been a dream. No wonder she spent three months there. Elizabeth was the only person she could talk to who understood anything of what had happened to her. The birth of our Lord. God enters our world. His world. The presentation. Mary and Joseph give their son back to God in the temple. There must have been mixed feelings for the parents as they pondered the words of Simeon. This child is set for the rising and fall of many in Israel. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Jesus is found in the temple discussing theology with the teachers after going missing for three days. He was 12 years old and would have been studying the scriptures, what we have today as the Old Testament, in preparation for his bar mitzvah. And, like all adolescents, he is establishing his independence as an adult. And inevitably there are differences with parents who do not always understand. The luminous mysteries were introduced by St. John Paul II and fill out Jesus' life between the joyful and the glorious mysteries. Jesus is baptised. It must have got Jesus to think when his six-month-old cousin, John the Baptist, forsook his birthright. Instead of following his father, Zechariah, into the robes and responsibilities of a temple priest. John instead goes into the desert, dressed just in camel hair and subsisting on locusts. John the Baptist had realised that temple sacrifices did not seem to be bringing the promised Messiah any nearer, and that what was needed was a change of behaviour by every individual. Tax collectors would have to be fair, soldiers would have to not abuse their power, teachers must not overcharge, and so on. And so Jesus comes to his cousin for baptism to seek his own destiny, and hears it from his father. And the Spirit of God alights on him, as it would later alight on the apostles, and as it does on each one of us in our own baptism. 
Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. This is one of my favourite mysteries because it shows Jesus not just being capable of turning something totally mundane into something sparkling and very special and full of joy, endorsing the celebration of marriage as the celebration of love and of its essence of overflowing to children but also to all who come in contact with a married couple. It also shows the mother, continuing motherhood of Mary. Just as she had pushed her son into the world three, 30 years previously, so now she pushes the Son of God into the world to show us what God wants to show us of himself. And she does it by the usual feminine wile of strategy of indirect approach. When he demurs, she just says to the servants, as she says to us, do whatever he tells you. The preaching of the kingdom. Jesus kept on saying, the kingdom of God is among you. Basically, this is the kingdom of love. Love is not an emotion or a feeling. St Paul says, it's living as if the other person is more important than oneself. In the kingdom of heaven, Father, Son and Holy Spirit each live as if the other two are more important than themselves. Jesus is obedient to the Father and he says, after me will come the Spirit who will tell you all sorts of things that I can't. On the other hand, the Father says at the Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. One of the most ex effective expressions of love is forgiveness or mercy. Yes, you have hurt me, but I'm not going to let that get in the way of our relationship. Jesus came to show us that God is not somebody waiting to write down in his black book all the little things we could do wrong. God is love. And Jesus not only told us this, but also showed us that he loves each one of us, not because of what we do or don't do, but because of who each one of us is. And he showed it by going to dine with prostitutes and sinners and by laying down his life for us. The kingdom of God arrived on this planet when Jesus became human. And when every one of us lives as if other people are more important than me, then the kingdom of God will be complete. The Transfiguration. Jesus had said, In truth I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And six days later, he took Peter, James and John, and they had a momentary glimpse of Jesus in his heavenly glory, supported by Moses and Elijah. And some of us are very occasionally encouraged by glimpses or experiences of God in his glory as C.S. Lewis describes in his book, Surprised by Joy. The institution of the Eucharist. Jesus making himself available and visible to all, for all time. We think of the incarnation as taking place 2,000 years ago, lasting for 33 years. But in the Eucharist, Jesus becomes, again, human flesh and blood under the appearance of bread and wine every day and all over the world, every time the priest says, this is my body, this is my blood. And when we receive communion, we're reminded that the third sense of the incarnation is 
that we are together, are in communion, not only with God, but with each other. Which is why when the risen Christ speaks to Saul, who became Paul, on the way to Damascus, he does not say, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we have to remember that we are the body of Christ. When we're feeling really up to here with our neighbour on the parish council who never stops talking nonsense, because every human body has its limitations, which brings us to the sorrowful mysteries, which, like the Stations of the Cross, remind us that for the Christian, the Paschal mystery is not just the resurrection of Jesus, it's the passion, death and resurrection. Ours is the only religion to have as its icon the image of a human being being tortured to death. The agony in the garden. They say that the worst part of going to the dentist is in the waiting room beforehand. And thinking of what he was about to go through, Jesus sweated blood and prayed, Father, all things are possible to you. Remove this cup from me. But not what I will, but what you will. And when he asked his friends, Peter, James and John, to support him, they just went off to sleep twice. The scourging at the pillar, flogging with the cat of nine tails. But each tail had, a, had a, at its end a little dumbbell of bone that lacerated the flesh. Only for Roman citizens was it limited to 40 strokes. The crowning with thorns. What often hurts even more than physical pain is mockery. And this was the moment when they dressed him up as a king, with a reed in his right hand as a scepter, and a crown made of thorns pressed into his scalp. And kneeling before him, they mocked him. Jesus carries the cross. If you want to follow me, he said, take up your cross and follow me. And taking up our cross means picking up all those weaknesses that we so often try to run away from in life. <clears throat> it means falling and then getting up again and going on. Jesus three falls in the stations of the cross. But it also means not being too proud to accept help when we need it, as Jesus did from Simon of Cyrene and from Veronica. No gesture of support is too small to be accepted with gratitude. Jesus dies on the cross. My God, my God, why have you deserted me? Jesus was like us in every respect. Tempted in every way that we are, although he never sinned. We talk of him bearing our sins on the cross. And perhaps this was the moment when that was most true. Although he had never sinned, here he experiences the effect of sin, which is to separate ourselves from God, the God, the, God the Father, and think that God has deserted us. We have to follow his example when we feel that and go on to pray, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But this is also where Jesus lived what he had preached. Greater love no one has than to lay down his life for others. The glorious mysteries. Jesus is raised from death to new life. We need to remember, in the middle of all the trials we experience, and especially the trials suffered by people whom we love, 
that the resurrection proves that God can and does eventually bring life and good out of any evil, including death. And if we don't believe that, St Paul says, then we're wasting our time trying to be Christians. Jesus ascends into heaven and shows us that life on this planet lasts only for a time, but leads to a life with God in heaven forever. But meanwhile, he passes his mission on to us and gives us, as he gave the apostles, the responsibility of bringing the good news that God loves each one of us to the whole world. The descent of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised to send us his own spirit. When he had emptied himself of his godness to become human in every way that we are human, it was his fellow member of the Trinity, the Spirit, who energised him and enabled him to work miracles and to behave in godly fashion. And it's that same spirit who not only gives particular gifts, such as healing, teaching and preaching, to particular people, as he did to the apostles at Pentecost, but who also grows his fruit in all of us who accept him. Listed in Galatians 5, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and above all, crowned with joy. In other words, love, in all its aspects of living as if the other person is more important than myself. All these fruits of love descend on us and grow in us while we make ourselves to the Spirit in our prayer time. Our Lady is assumed into heaven. Our Lady was not God. She was human. And her being assumed into heaven shows us that that is our own destiny as human beings, to end up in heaven, so that we will share in the divinity of God. The crowning of Our Lady is Queen of Heaven. And as the human, be the human mother of God, insofar as there is any hierarchy in heaven, she is the boss lady. And also our go-to person when we want to ask something of God. So perhaps today you might like to make time to pray five decades of the rosary using some of these ideas. So have a blessed day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.